Hello, this is Candy with eyes to Jesus.blogspot.com and welcome as we continue on our study going through the book of Isaiah. Now, in our last study of chapter 33, we ended the woes section of Isaiah, the woe chapters. Here in chapter 34, while it is dealing somewhat with uh, Zion and Edom, it is also dealing with our future. This is this is unfulfilled prophecy that we're still waiting to happen as well. So chapter 33 uh, ended with uh, talking about the future New Jerusalem. Now recall New Jerusalem, we have to have the seven-year tribulation, the thousand-year millennium of peace, and then a bit after that is when New Jerusalem comes down to the earth. So now chapter 34 is going to back up on the timeline uh, to where we are a little over a thousand years before New Jerusalem. Uh, so it's going to back us up into the seven-year tribulation, and uh, it's going to go into not the whole tribulation, but it's going to highlight some parts of that tribulation. So Isaiah chapter 34 is our future as well. So go ahead and turn in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 34. I am reading from the Young's Literal Translation. And let's get into this very meaty and fascinating chapter. So chapter 34 verse 1 says, Come near ye nations to hear, and ye peoples give attention. Here doth the earth and its fullness, the world and all its productions. So who's chapter 34 written to? Since it's written to nations, peoples, earth, the world. In other words, this chapter is for everybody, the whole world, all nations, all peoples. It's for you, it's for me, it is our future. Verse 2. For wrath is to Jehovah against all the nations, and fury against the, all their host. He hath devoted them to destruction, he hath given them to slaughter. So this is talking about the wrath of God. Now, his wrath partially held back is unleashed in the first half of the seven-year tribulation. Then after the middle tribulation rapture of Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 through 18, parallel that with 1 Corinthians 15, Daniel chapter 12, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Anyways, after the middle tribulation, seventh trumpet rapture, then we get into God's wrath fully unleashed, the seven vials of wrath. So a lot of the judgments in the first half of the tribulation, our um, nature, uh, physics related type of disasters that God just holds back and doesn't protect us from. And then uh, when you get into the second half of the tribulation, it's a lot more of God's hand being directly involved in those judgments. Okay, so here it's describing some of uh, the seven-year tribulation. Uh, let's continue on verse 3. And their wounded are cast out, and their carcasses caused their stench to ascend, and melted have been mountains from their blood. Now, take a look at verse 4, because verse 4 that we're about to get into specifically describes the sixth seal in the seven-year tribulation, the sixth seal in the Revelation. So... Verse 4 says, And consumed have been all the host of the heavens, and rolled together as a book have been the heavens, and all their hosts do fade, as a fading of a leaf of a vine, and for the fading one of a fig tree. So let's read the sixth seal in Revelation. You'll see these two are definitely talking about the same thing. So if you turn to Revelation chapter 6, and that happens to be where the sixth seal is, and we're going to take a look at verses 12 through 14. And those say, And I saw when he opened the sixth seal, and lo, a great earthquake came. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of the heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree doth cast cast her winter figs by a great wind being shaken, and heaven departed as a scroll rolled up, and every mountain and island out of their places they were moved. So what could cause that? What type of natural physics things could cause such an event? This sounds, scientifically, it sounds a lot like the earth being flipped over. 
So, if the earth is being flipped over or turned around rapidly, it will appear like uh, the skies are being collapsed or closed up or rolled up like a scroll or the closing of a book. So we're being flipped over. And of course, that's going to cause serious earthquakes. That's going to cause everything that we just read described. Uh, and then what can cause something so catastrophic as to the point of messing with our Earth's tilt and orbit so that it flips over? Uh, that could be caused by a very large celestial body coming close to Earth's orbit, and therefore pulling on the Earth a bit. And so while it's pulling on the Earth, it can cause the Earth to flip over. And uh, this is where if you start getting into um, the ancient Babylonian and Sumerian tablets and you read about uh, the 12th planet uh, or planet X, as the scientific community sometimes often calls it, uh, and then this planet is uh, conjectured to be very, very, very much larger than Earth. Uh, this could be a Jupiter-sized planet. It could be even bigger than Jupiter. And it's conjectured that this planet is on a very, very long elliptical orbit and that it's possibly out there in the Oort cloud right now, uh, heading our way. Uh, regardless of where this uh, planet is, that's even talked about in the ancient tablets, uh, if this lines up, that could be the body that when it finally comes through our solar system on its very long orbit, that uh, depending on where it is on its orbit and where Earth is at the time, it could pass very closely to the Earth, and if it passes close enough, it would cause a flip. So it's quite possible that that is what the sixth seal is. And uh, we see the sixth seal here described in Isaiah chapter 34, verse 4. Continuing on, for soaked in the heavens was my sword. Lo, on Edom it cometh down, on the people of my curse for judgment. Now, Edom kind of has a double play here in this chapter. Um, we will see a literal judgment on the land of Edom, the area of Edom, uh, that will occur during the tribulation and what happens to it afterwards. But we also see that Edom is uh, also representative of the nations because Edom hated hated Israel. And uh, in the time of the tribulation, all the nations hate Israel as Edom hated Israel. So Edom can be read here as being representative of all the nations that hate Israel, but it is also literally Edom as we continue reading that we will see. So continuing on with verse 7, that says, And come down have reams with them, and bullocks with bulls, and soaked have been their land from blood, and their dust from fatness is made. Uh, reams is, some Bible translations will translate that as a unicorn. It is probably a rhinoceros, possibly uh, one of the uh, extinct one-horned rhinoceroses that had the very long, very powerful horn. Uh, verse 8, For a day of vengeance is to Jehovah, a year of recompense for Zion's strife. So year here is being used kind of uh, poetically, symbolically, and uh, the day of vengeance. God starts bringing judgment upon the world in the seven-year tribulation, and it's partially held back in the first half of the tribulation, and those with the seal of God in their foreheads, so that would be the 144,000 Jews who get sealed in Revelation chapter 7, but then that will also be all Christians who are already Christians. We have that seal right now, and anybody who becomes a Christian. So anyone with the seal of God in their forehead, which the seal, as we read in Ephesians, is the Holy Spirit, um, we have a measure of protection during the first three and a half years of the tribulation if we stay true to God and trust in Him. Just like we've read in our past uh, few chapters that the house of Judah had protection from the Assyrians, even though the Assyrians took down the house of Israel, but Judah had to trust in God. Those who strayed from their trust in God and turned to their fellow man, they didn't find, they didn't meet a very good end. But those who remained faithful to Jehovah God, they had a measure of protection and they ended up coming through and the house of Judah survived the Assyrians. Okay, so that's the same thing here. That is a pre-type of the first half of the tribulation. That those who are sealed, those who are gods, if we stay true to God and we trust Him, then even though literally the earth be flipped upside down, we are His children and His hand is over us and He gives us a measure of protection. Now, when His full wrath is unleashed, we're not here for that. We're raptured at that. That's the seventh, Trump, seventh trumpet rapture. And then His wrath is fully unleashed. Then the vengeance of Jehovah is fully 
coming about. And then the day of the Lord occurs at the end of the seven-year tribulation. That's when Jesus Christ comes back, for his second physical coming to the battle of Armageddon. We, his saints, follow him behind him. Okay, so verse 9, And turned have been her streams to pitch, and her dust to brimstone, and her land hath become burning pitch. Streams drying up. And then literally this will happen in Edom. And they don't just dry up to dust, but the dust, the very dust itself burns, and it's like brimstone. Verse 10, by night and by day she is not quenched. To the age go up doth her smoke. From generation to generation she is waste. Forever and ever none is passing into her. Who is the her here? This is Edom. This is going to happen in the tribulation. Edom receives the land and the area receives a massive judgment. So no one will inhabit that area geographically again after this occurs in the seven-year tribulation. At least no human will. Verse 11, And possess her, Edom, do pelican and hedgehog and owl and raven dwell in her. And he hath stretched out over her a line of vacancy and stones of emptiness, vacant and empty of human beings. Animals are there. Verse 12, To the kingdom her freemen they call, but there are none there, and all her princes are at an end. So you can call, hello, is anybody there? There will be no answer because the geographical area that where Edom was will be evacuated. It will be empty. It will be desolate of human life. Verse 13, And God up her palaces have thorns, nettle, and bramble are in her fortresses, and it hath been a habitation of dragons, a court of, of daughters of an ostrich. So everything's just going to kind of break down to entropy, and the thorns and thistles are going to grow because there's no one to till the ground, and everything's going to become overgrown, and we're going to have all sorts of different wild beasts and animals that will inhabit the Edom area instead. Verse 14, And met have Zeem and Aim, and the goat for its companion calleth. Only there resteth hath the night owl, and hath found for herself a place of rest. Zeem and Aim here, those are just words meaning various wild animals. So various wild animals, all sorts of wild animals are going to make their abode in the geographical location of Edom. Verse 15, There made her nest hath the bittern, yea, she layeth and hath hatched, and hath gathered under her shadow. Only there gathered have been vultures, each with its companion. So a bittern, that's in the family of the heron birds. Okay, and then we have vultures. Now, heron birds, they're, they're more of an aquatic type of bird, and that kind of goes along with be, uh, the wild beast aim, which are kind of like wild beasts of an island. Okay, and then vultures, those are more of the land birds that are eating the carrion and dead things. And that goes along with the wild beasts of Zeem. Wild beasts of Zeem are wild animals of the wilderness or of the desert. Okay, verse 6. Seek out the book of Jehovah and read. One of these hath not been lacking, none hath missed its companion, for my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit he hath gathered them. Look at the first part of this verse. Who was this chapter written to? Everybody. Has this chapter happened yet? No. This is still future prophecy, so this is 100% relevant for us today. And what does it say? It says, Seek out the book of Jehovah and read. The Bible is the word of God, which God preserved forever. Psalm 12, Psalm 12, verse 6 says, promises that God preserved his word. He promises the preservation of his word all throughout the Old and New Testament. The Bible is the only book with over 6,000 ancient manuscripts the only ancient writing of any kind with that amount of manuscripts, and they agree with each other. We got some spelling variations and a few uh, words in different order, but over 95% agree with each other. The uh, disagreeing texts uh, are texts that you can see have edit marks on them when you look at them under a blue light, under an ultraviolet light, and that uh, if you were to read those texts without the edit marks, then those manuscripts would agree as well. But 95% of agreement, you know that's impossible. And over 6,000 ancient manuscripts, you know that's impossible. And if you take in ancient manuscripts of the Bible in other languages, that jumps up to 25,000. That's very impossible. Not one ancient work in existence has anywhere near the manuscriptural evidence that the Bible has. The Bible is the Word of God. Seek out the book of Jehovah and read. 
Are you reading from your Bible every single day? Are you studying your Bible? Are you partaking of this knowledge that God gives to us? Because remember, God talks about my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Make sure you're not destroyed for lack of knowledge. Seek out the book of Jehovah and read. Okay, now the rest of this verse goes with verse 17. So, one of these hath not been lacking. None hath missed its companion. For my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit he hath gathered them. And he hath cast for them a lot, and his hand hath apportioned it to them by line. Unto the age they possess it, to all generations they dwell in it. What's the antecedent to they that that's talking about? It's talking about the aim and the zim, all these wild animals and beasts that possess Edom. It's talking about after the geographical location of Edom is destroyed during the seven year tribulation, it will never be inhabited by humans again, but it will belong to a variety of wild beasts and animals. Quite fascinating and interesting if you think about it. And uh, it's important, by the way, keep your antecedents straight, your pronouns. What is your pronoun referring to? It's very important. It's basic grammar, and it's a basic grammatical rule that you always need to find the antecedent of which your pronoun is referring to. And this is why a lot of people have trouble understanding 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. They switch around the antecedents for their pronouns. But if you follow the pronoun through, then you see very clearly that it's Antichrist being taken away that refers to his head wound in the middle of the tribulation and then he is inhabited by Satan. And so then you find out that uh, the antecedent to he there can no way be the church or the Holy Spirit or the rapture. The antecedent to he is Antichrist. So keep your antecedent straight and you can really understand the scriptures. you got to just follow the pronouns and follow the original noun that they came from. So this concludes my study for today. I hope it blessed you in some way, and I look forward uh, to doing chapter 35. Have a blessed day.